Hello everyone, Kevin Remedy here, IT Pro Evangelist with Microsoft, and today we're going to be doing part two of our three-part series on System Center 2012 Unified Installer. Now the reason I'm doing this series is because the Unified Installer is a great tool for deploying System Center 2012 in a test environment, but unfortunately it's a little complex, and it's complex in terms of what you need to do to be ready for the install once you launch it. There's a number of components and things that need to be installed and, and configured prior to doing, doing the install of the different components of System Center, so that's what we talked about in part one. And in part two today we're going to talk about preparing the, the machines. Now in my environment I have virtual machines configured and ready to go. and um, In fact, let me, talk, let me actually show you what my environment looks like. Here's the Hyper-V Manager. I have a number of Hyper-V hosts currently in my environment. I have a domain controller. I have my orchestrator machine, the config man machine, and so on, all named appropriately. Uh, ops man on this server here, part of my two node cluster, as well as uh, three additional roles available here. System Center Service Manager, there's the data warehouse server. We do need to have one for that as well. So the, uh, the odd one is S Service Manager. It actually requires two servers, one um, basic service manager installation and another <coughs> for the data warehouse component. Uh, you don't have the option of not installing that using the unified installer. Um, so I've got these machines all up and running and I've done some preliminary configuration but the idea here is that um, really what I did is I built a server uh, and I installed all the updates that were required for that server and I based the hard disk for these running machines all off of that same parent disk. I used a differencing disk configuration. So that way I'm saving a lot of space. I'm able to basically on my my local machine here, that top one, uh, these four folders representing those machines and I'm really only using um, gosh just uh, about two-thirds of the disk for those those machines. So it gives me a lot of room to expand. And That's going to be important when we start running the installations. We're going to need that extra space. Um, so anyway I have these machines all running and configured, and I'm going to go to that web page that we talked about with the uh, System Center user's guide for System Center 2012 Unified Installer. So when you're at that guide, you'll notice that there's a number of options. We already talked about the system requirements, and that's where we found the information about the prerequisites. You want to then also look at this documentation for preparing the installer computer as well as the target computer. Now that's what we're going to do today uh, and, and leave it uh, prior to r actually running the unified installer. That's, that'll be our part three screencast. And the reason you need to do some preparation is because there's a number of things that need to be in place not only with regard to what's installed but also very importantly configuration of the firewall, configuration of certain group policy options for allowing remote access. Remote administration is a key part of making this work because what happens is you choose an installer computer and then it's from that computer that it launches the install you launch the install of the unified installer and then it drives the installation of components to the other target computers and that's what we also have to have configured as well <clears throat> now in my environment and in any environment really if you want to use one of the component servers as both the installer as well as one of the targets the target for that one has to be orchestrator so I've chosen my orchestrator computer currently running with nothing installed, just the basics. I ran all the updates, I built this machine, basically nothing installed otherwise. Uh, well, that's not entirely true. Let me actually point this out. On that base image that I built all these machines from, I did add one feature, and that is the .NET Framework features. So as you see, I already have chosen just that one .NET Framework 3.5.1 in order to kind of save a little time during the deployment and that became part of my base image. The other information, or the other part of this base image is simply the fact that I've installed all updates that were available. Okay, so once I have this machine, this is the one that I'm actually going to run the the installer from. And uh, another thing I did to kind of prepare for things is I copied that SC2012 folder that we built in part one. I copied that over to the local machine. Now that's also important because you do have to have access to these files uh, on a local disk. It can't be a, a, a map drive. Um, I believe you can use UNC paths uh, in order to do this. I just chose to do it on the local machine. Okay, uh, So we're actually going to be launching in part 3 from this folder right here, this setup.exe. Now, back on the description of configuring the installer computer. I'm going to click on that. 
because that's going to give us some good details about what we need to do. And you notice that there are some things we need to do in local policy settings. This is something that um, I, I could do in group policy, I could do it locally, um, and I actually chose to do these two local. Now, the nice thing about this is this summarizes what you need to do. Some of it through policy, some through, again, could be done through policy as well as done through uh, WinRM commands on the installer computer. So if I click on how to edit the local group policy on the installer computer, it walks me through the process. So load the group policy editor, the local group policy editor, and then add these policy settings. And there's, most of them are found under local computer policy, computer configuration, administrative templates, system, and you see credential delegation as well as um, fresh credentials and so on. Uh, delegating fresh credentials and so on. So actually, let me show you what I did there. On orchestrator, and on whatever installer computer you chose, you can run gpedit.msc, and that's where you can then go into the administrative templates, Windows components. Oh, I'm sorry, not Windows components. System. What was it again? Let's look. <laughs> uh, Minister of Temple System and Credential Delegation. Got it. System and Credential Delegation. There it is. And so here are the two items that are documented for us. One is Fresh Credentials. So I want to make sure that that's configured. Enable it. And then it also documents the fact that we need to add a value here. And that value is WSMAN slash star. And it's going to be the same one for the other item as well. So we'll go ahead and copy that to the clipboard. And then fresh credentials with NTM only, NTLM only authentication. All right. So there we go. And the other two items, if I uh, go back, also could be done with WinRM commands. So what I'm going to do is use those. And you can find those, again, just like we did for local policy. You can also see the WinRM commands on the installer computer. If you click that link, it brings you to the command line, actually two lines, two commands. Um, should be separated right about there. Um, now I'm going to actually copy those from a little cheat notepad that I've created. But you get the idea. I can actually then on a Run administrator, so administrative command prompt. So we'll go ahead and do that. Run as administrator. And then I'll paste. And in Hyper-V connections, I actually need to type the clipboard text this way. But we'll have that take care of that for us. All right, so good. So now, that's the installer computer. Let's back up one step here and think about the target computers. Now, what it does is very similar to the installer computer. It tells you what, what the uh, local policy settings should be. And of course, that told me, you know, rather than having to go to every single machine and edit these policy settings, um, I'd rather do something with group policy. I'd rather actually use group policy to deploy to all the target computers. And by the way, the installer is a target as well, so it applies. Uh, use that to set these policies. So the way I did that was I took this documentation and again you have documentation on how to edit the policy on the target computer but instead of doing it on the local machine I actually went to group policy and I created in my Active Directory an organizational unit and I put all of the destination targets as machine servers within that organizational unit. Then in group policy, I applied to that organizational unit this policy. So let me edit, just quickly edit this policy and show you where I made those changes. So in this case, it is Windows Components. And then if I make that a little more visible, we have Remote Management Service. And here is where I configured the two that were required in the service. So one of them was allow automatic configuration of listeners. And that had an option. You had to put a star next to both of these filters. So we did that. And then the other was allow cred SSP authentication and simply enable that. And then under 
Windows Remote Shell, there were also two there that we had to configure. You see why I wanted to do this once in group policy and have it apply to all the machines rather than going machine to machine. Allow Remote Shell Access and maximize, uh, maximum amount of memory in megabytes per shell. This one actually does have a value that you need to add here and the value is 248 meg. All right. So now I've done that for the target computers and I've made sure that they all are members of that organizational unit and once they restart or once you run GP update slash force uh, you'll be able to have those policies apply. Now in my experience I have found that this also requires you to use the WinRM commands on the target computers as well. Even though some of these seem to duplicate what was done in policy and they they talk about this as an option to applying policy. In fact, this in particular, this one, when QC, so for the quick and figure Windows Remote Management, needs to be done on each machine. So you will not be able to get away with that. Um, and again, I have a little saved text here with that text. So I'm going to copy that to the clipboard and I'll go back to my orchestrator machine. And I want to do this again on all of the machines. Let's just maximize that out a little bit. I would do this on all of the machines that are going to be targets for the System Center 2012 components. All right. So, done that in this machine. And uh, I've already done that on the other machines. I did that ahead of time, so we're all good there as well. Oh, and of course the last thing, since I did make a policy change through group policy, I also want to make sure that they apply. So while you're on those machines and you're doing that uh, copy and paste, you also want to run a GP update if you want to get right into it. You're not going to be restarting those machines. Oop, GP update. In order to refresh the local policy with the domain policy. Okay. So that's pretty much it. Once the machines are all set in place, once you have them configured with the right policy settings, um, oh, I almost forgot, there is one more. I talked about the firewall. Uh, there is documentation here, I'll back up one here, for the installer computer to configure the firewall on the, on the installer computer. And it's a lengthy description of which ports to open uh, inbound TCP 81 and 1433 and so on. And you can do all that um, on the installer computer and you'll need to do that on all of the other computers as well. For the sake of uh, reducing complexity and the fact that this is a simple test environment. I'm not worried about the firewall per, per se on any of these machines. I also decided to in the policy that I applied to these machines and we'll find that under Windows settings and security settings and Windows firewall. I'm going to just right click on the firewall with advanced security, look at properties and what I did was for the domain profile I turned the firewall off. Okay, I didn't leave it not configured, I actually turned it off. I didn't have to worry about private and public, these are all domain joint machines, so for the domain profile, turned it off. And so the result of that is that, again, for those computers that are part of that organizational unit, if I look at the firewall here, let's go full screen so we can see this better. So look at the Windows firewall and turning the firewall on and off, you'll see that this one is disabled and the cur firewall is tur currently turned off. And that's true about all those machines. So that simplified, again, this remote distribution of software uh, for this initial deployment. Later on, you can re-enable the firewalls. You can uh, configure them properly. But I just really wanted to have a quick way to get this up and running. So that's really it. Again, link to download the components is http colon wack aka.ms private cloud. Uh, here's the link to the uh, installer of the user guide on TechNet and I'll put these links up on the page where you found this video and some additional resources for you as well. So I hope you found this useful and again in part three we will actually perform the installation. So we're getting close. Uh, we will do this next time. Thanks for watching and we'll see you then.